Excellencies, uh, dear colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, dear students, um, I'm very happy to welcome you to this year's Fulbright Lecture, which is uh, quite a tradition now. So every year, uh, for the last 17 years, um, we had this Fulbright uh, Lecture, always around uh, the same time. Uh, always uh, organized, obviously, in cooperation with the American Embassy and with the Fulbright Commission. And uh, I want to say thank you very, very much for all those years of cooperation. We have had many great American scholars here with us who contributed to the intellectual vibrancy of the school, uh, who did great teaching for us and so on. And uh, I may also mention in this context that some of them are still coming back to us to teach every year and do a great job, so very grateful uh, for this cooperation. I understand that the executive director cannot be here today. He's on his way from Berlin to Vienna. Uh, if he would have been here, then I would have uh, said a lot of uh, words of thank you and a lot of praise uh, for him as well. Um, if I'm not mistaken, he has been um, the... He's been heading the Austrian Fulbright Commission, I think, for 22 years, which is a very, very long time. And uh, many of the cooperative agreements that we started with him uh, were very much uh, done together with him. So, so thanks a lot to Lonnie. Um, a few words, uh, obviously, also about our new Fulbright professor for this academic year, uh, Professor Bartlett. And uh, since he's still quite new in town, um, just uh, a, few, a few words, a short introduction. He is the Gand Professor of the Liberal Arts at the Department of Political Science of the University of Vermont. Um, he teaches two courses for us. That's uh, Comparative Environmental Politics and International Environmental Governance. And uh, I may add in this context that he also started a bit earlier than, uh, than your predecessors, which makes us very happy. So you're here about three weeks longer than, 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 uh, than what was uh, the custom before. And it gives you students actually uh, a great opportunity to interact even more with them. Um, Professor Bartlett has published extensively, um, um, published six books, not going to mention all of them, with MIT Press, Oxford University Press, I think the one with Cambridge University Press is forthcoming. Um, some of his uh, publications he did together with Walter Frank Weber, who may still ring a bell with some of you because he was our Fulbright uh, scholar three years ago, if, I'm, if, I, if I recall the years correctly. Um, Robert won book prizes, uh, published many peer-reviewed articles. Uh, I stopped counting when I was uh, at the number 22. Uh, in very renowned journals, um, so he really has a prolific record. Um, he's going to talk to us today about governing climate futures, democracy rights and the global environment. And uh, Robert at this stage also um, maybe formally again welcome to Vienna and we are greatly looking forward to your talk. to be here, and uh, uh, thank you to uh, faculty, uh, administration, students, uh, guests, uh, to, uh, to, to this, I guess, 17th, um, a lecture of the 17th um, Fulbright. So my talk is about governing climate futures, democracy, rights, uh, and the global environment. Um, so I'll start by talking a, a bit about climate futures and governance. Climate warming is happening and accelerating. Average global temperatures are rising more rapidly in some places than in others, both at sea level and at higher altitudes. Weather patterns are shifting. The oceans are warming significantly. Humans are responsible for the cumulative increases in atmospheric uh, discharges that are causing these effects which are already having major economic, uh, social, and political consequences that will multiply even should human beings uh, somehow uh, cease making any new net contributions to the atmosphere. Uh, that much really is incontrovertible. 
Moreover, every comprehensive scientific assessment, global scientific assessment for three decades, and we've been doing this for about 30 years now, uh, has concluded that the effects of rising levels of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere are going to be greater than was previously thought. If all of our previous assessments have been too conservative, there's every reason to suspect that current ones will be as well. Climate warming presents uh, arguably the most challenging set of problems that humans have ever faced. Climate warming has the potential to render many parts of the planet much less habitable, to impose immense economic costs and dislocations, and to destabilize social and political systems. Its consequences are complex, variable, irreversible, long-term, inter intergenerational, and very unevenly distributed. Its causes are tied up with most consumption and production processes, virtually everything humans do and will ever want to do. It is a super wicked problem, collective action problem, whose only known solutions will require both micro, local, and global governance of a multiplicity of profound changes that will affect all humans. Possible technological fixes have been discussed, have been possibly identified, but they're all speculative and infused with unknown and probably unknowable dangers and risks. There are four possible categories of actions and strategies that can be taken to minimize climate warming, prevention being already too late. Abatement actions entail not so simply reducing emissions of greenhouse gases, primarily carbon dioxide and methane, and black carbon. Uh, this has been the focus of most international tension over the last 30 years and of most intentional and explicit domestic policies. Mitigation consists of various possible actions that can cause the absorption, storage, or slowing down of the movement of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere, planting trees, uh, uh, changing, uh, 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 creating what are known as carbon sinks, um, et cetera. Adaptation refers to efforts to increase the resilience of artificial and ecological systems in the presence of climate warming effects. And finally, solar radiation management consists of the adoption of technologies that would alter the amount of radiation coming through or leaving the Earth's atmosphere. Some means of radiation management are complex and speculative with unknown dangers and risks, but there are a few that are simple and well understood. Simply changing the color of our roofs, for example, or the color of of, of roads uh, from black or dark to white uh, could make a significant difference. So some of these will be things that in, undoubtedly uh, we'll, we'll want to uh, adopt. The super wicked nature of the problem of climate warming means that any governance of human behavior to reduce its causes and effects must be multi-level, multi-domain, and multi-dimensional, addressing many matters simultaneously and undertaken long before risks, uncertainties, and potentials are well understood. Successful governing of climate futures will require an ensemble, an ensemble of strategies and policies that, one, are tailored to the scale of the particular contributing causes or effects being addressed and can be accommodated to the diversity of humanity. Two, are seen as just, fair, and legitimate. Three, contribute to the development of behavioral standards and expectations norms that compel and describe actual behavioral regularities, norms, with a minimum of costly supervision and enforcement. Four, can be coordinated with each other through non-centralized processes. Five, allow, encourage, and facilitate experimentation and learning. And six, can draw on both general scientific knowledge and the immense wealth of tacit knowledge that is embedded in human communities around the world knowledge of both cultural practices and the environments of particular places and times. More democratic governance at every level and in every domain of human activity is likely to have greater success than less democratic governance in producing climate futures that humans will judge as more desirable because it's really only democratic governance or more democratic governance that has any hope of, of really fulfilling these uh, six different criteria. So, governance and democracy. Scholars of the comparative environmental performance of state governance institutions have long noted a positive correlation between the democratic nature of a political system and its greater success, 
nowhere complete success, but greater success in addressing causes and effects of environmental harms. Performance tends to be stronger in countries with more consociational democratic features. Uh, so typically, uh, studies have been done to try to rank which countries have the greenest environmental policies. Policies tend to rank countries like Denmark, um, uh, other Scandinavian countries, uh, Germany, uh, the Netherlands. Uh, performance also tends to be stronger in countries with more consociational. Performance tends to be stronger in countries with more consociational democratic features, and in countries with more robust public spheres and civil societies. But countries that are democratically adversarial also perform significantly better than those which, in which democratic institutions are absent, weak, or poorly established. Although some political theorists have speculated for half a century, this literature goes back until in, into the 1960s, and there's been a, a couple of books published in, just in the last month, uh, speculating that ultimately cumulative environmental stresses uh, may ultimately require suspension of democratic processes and liberties and the empowerment of a leviathan political authority. There's actually zero evidence from our experience in modernity that this would work as well as, much less better than, more democratic arrangements. A considerable number of distinctly democratic practices and successfully dealing with environmental matters have been documented by political scientists over the last half century. Many of them notably in international, in the, in the realm of international environmental governance and in particular in the last 10 to 15 years in beginning efforts at climate warming governance. Much hangs, of course, on what is meant by democratic practices, democracy, and more democratic. So, what do we mean by democracy and more democratic? Aspects of what should or must constitute democracy have been highly contested by theorists and the political active for more than two millennia. In recent centuries, common understanding has revolved around the idea of voting and the counting or accumulation of votes to make collective choices or to express the collective will. This understanding of democracy has been labeled by, re, in, in recent uh, years, by scholars as aggregative democracy. In other words, this democracy, uh, the, the primary feature of which is aggregating uh, votes or aggregating the individual uh, 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 judgments of, of the people who are voting. Historically, much of the political push for democratization is focused on spreading and strengthening meaningful aggregative democracy. This is enormously important, of course. But democracy has always required more than an opportunity to have a say by voting. Besides denoting a system of governing activity that involves choosing leaders or policies or otherwise making collective decisions under conditions of equal and near universal franchise, that is, the right to vote and to participate, any robust democratic system must also provide for, two, active participation on the basis of equality in politics and civic life, three, the rule of law in which behavioral standards and requirements apply equally to all, and four, the equal protection of the human rights of all people. Well, and much of the research, much of the scholarship on democracy and governance and democracy and environmental governance in particular has paid relatively scant attention to this fourth requirement or criteria of democracy. The necessity for democracies to recognize and protect human rights means that for any democracy to remain a democracy, some kinds of choices must be put beyond democratic collective choice processes. Rights are actually a kind of paradox at the heart of democracy. Any real democracy, by consensus, puts some matters beyond the reach of majority choice. And of course, a corollary paradox is that one of the ways a democracy can become more democratic is by recognizing and protecting more rights, thus preemptively disallowing more collective choices by democratic processes such as voting. Rights are, in effect, possible choices that a society has decided by consensus will not be allowable, even if favored by democratic majorities. Rights thus can be understood in part politically as constituting the bounds, the bounds of legitimate democratic action. 
Rights are, in effect, possible choices that a society has. I'm repeating myself. The political sociological governance perspective that this presents, this definition of rights or this understanding of rights, conceptualizes the term as a shorthand label for areas of policy consensus about which, uh, uh, with, about which tells us what must be done, what may be done or not done, and what must not be done. So rights function as a sort of final vocabulary, as Richard Rorty used the phrase. Rights give us a terminology that we no longer feel the need to define or defend once they're established. Of course, there's a lot of, of uh, defining and defending uh, on the way to establishing substantive rights. Uh, but once that happens, we no longer feel the need to define or defend them. And a collection, they provide a collection of discourses in which that language allows us sensibly and plausibly to engage. This political conception of human rights is distinct from three other conceptions of rights. Intrinsic rights, the notion that rights somehow come with human beings, if we're talking about human rights, uh, or in the, in the environmental realm, you always hear about rights of nature. Uh, so this conception that there's some sort of natural rights that uh, rivers or mountains or ecosystems or Gaia uh, has. Um, uh, adjudicatory rights. Adjudicatory rights are, are the kind of rights that become established gradually by societies by bubbling up in, the, in, uh, in terms of the ways that these societies uh, decide uh, and resolve conflicts uh, and certain kinds of, of rights uh, emerge and are accepted as, as a result of, uh, of these processes. Or declaratory rights. Uh, declaratory rights would be uh, the United Nations uh, Declaration on Human Rights. Um, uh, and various other uh, such declarations uh, by the many different countries of the world, bills of rights, for example. Um, the political recognition establishment of substantive human rights is always preceded by and accompanied by extended discourses about them as intrinsic adjudicatory, adjudicatory or declaratory rights, uh, but adjudicatory, declaratory, and intrinsic rights very often do not exist as political reality, being recognized and treated as rights. Substantive established human rights have never been a gift, not from God, nor from nature, nor from kings, not even from wise founders. They're won gradually through concerted and collective action arising from a vibrant civil society supported by various forms of public subsidy. Rights revolutions originate in pressure from below in civil society, not leadership from above. Substantive rights, then, are consensually recognized essential preconditions for democratic governance. And of course, it's not hard to think of various kinds of rights, the uh, 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 most basic of which is, is the right to, to, to vote, but the, the right to assemble, the right to speech, the freedom of the press, and so on and so forth. The real world of democratic politics and governance since the mid-20th century has been transformed by a human rights revolution that has emerged in fits and starts, but one in which environmental rights have played an increasingly prominent role since 1970. This revolution has profound implications for conceptualizing the emergence of a global climate governance system and its prospects for realization. So, what is the place of rights in climate future? What can we see from the recent past and begin to project uh, where, what, what, what might be possible in the future uh, and also what might be required in the future? Existing and emerging substantive human rights will continue to have significant implications for the extension of any democratic governance of climate warming. The 2015 Paris Agreement on Climate Change recognizes the intersections between human rights and climate governance. Only in the preamble, but it's there. There are three other brief examples I'll present here of categories of existing and developing substantive human rights that will continue to have significant implications for the extension of democratic governance of climate warming. These are, one, access to information and decision-making processes, two, access to food and water, and three, a standalone right to a clean and healthy environment. So let me just spend a, a few minutes with a little bit of background on each of these. Uh, the Convention on Access to Information, Public Participation and Decision Making, and Access to Justice in Environmental Matters, 
um, and that probably is not a record for the longest title of a treaty, uh, but it's long enough, so it's never called by that title. It's known as the Aarhus Convention. Uh, this convention or treaty grants the public rights, grants the public rights regarding access to information, public participation, and access to justice and environmental decision making, governmental decision making, excuse me, uh, governmental decision making processes on matters concerning the local, national, transboundary boundary environment. It requires that every citizen should have the right to wide and easy access to environmental information that public authorities must collect and disseminate information in a timely and transparent manner, that the public must be informed regarding all environmentally relevant projects and must have the right, the chance to participate during the decision making and legislative process, and that the public has the right to judicial or administrative recourse procedures in case of violations of existing environmental law or the principles of the convention itself. As for the fundamental right of uh, uh, to, right to food and water. Access to food is a matter of fundamental human right as a product of a cluster of international and regional norm building efforts. The normative core of this process is not that people should be given food and water, but rather that people are entitled to enjoy the preconditions, including the environmental preconditions necessary to be able to provide for themselves. So this right is established in various uh, aspects of of uh, declaratory uh, of international law, uh, now pretty universally accepted uh, and uh, having uh, real consequences in uh, uh, policy making and governance. Article 25 of the 1948 Universal Declaration of Human Rights, Article 11 of the 1966 International Convention on Economic, Social, and Cultural Rights, the 2009 Optional Protocol to that convention, 2012 Food Assistance Convention, Article 14 of the 1979 Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women, Article 24 of the 1989 Convention on the Rights of the Child, and Article 28 of the 2008 Convention on the right, uh, Rights of Persons with Disability, and that is not an exhaustive list. The third category, uh, a standalone right to a healthy or clean environment is considerably less well established in international treaty law, but nevertheless has been recognized uh, by several non-binding international uh, agreements uh, and several regional, uh, by, by, I mean across transnational regional human rights instruments. It's also been recognized in more than 92 national constitutions, on average one country per year for uh, uh, recent decades has at least one country per year has adopted a uh, standalone right to a healthy or clean environment. Uh, some of those have now been uh, taken to court. Uh, there have been some rulings that uh, 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 judges uh, have been reluctant to um, uh, go very far in interpreting uh, this right, but have found uh, uh, some some uh, uh, recourse uh, in, in, in interpreting these provisions of, of national constitutions. Um, uh, and so, uh, also, in addition to the, the national constitutions, rulings from the high courts of at least 12 countries have found that such a right, while not explicit, is implicit in the provisions of that country's fundamental law. Other existing and emerging rights that are likely to be impaired by climate impacts or by actions to address climate warming causes or effects include the right to life, uh, the right to shelter, the right to a high attainable standard of health, the right to self-determination, uh, various fairly well-established now rights of indigenous peoples. There is also increasing recognition acceptance that states have various democratic procedural duties that are significant to the environment, such as doing impact assessment, facilitating public participation, and providing access for environmental remedies. So, back to governing climate futures, democracy, rights, and the global environment. In conclusion, we can see that over time, over the time horizon of a few decades, democratization of environmental governance generally, and climate warming in particular, that we've seen progress and suffered some setbacks, of course. This is not uh, unidirectional, the development of rights. Uh, and we see this in many countries and internationally. 
Uh, and of course, the international developments tend to reinforce national developments and even subnational developments and vice versa. This democratization has happened with respect to all four essential characteristics of democracy identified earlier. Any governance that successfully steers humans to a climate future that is less than catastrophic will have to have a wide, deep, and strong democratic character built on a substantial environmental human rights foundation. None of this is to say, none of this is to say that more democracy is a guarantee of effectiveness or of governance success. It's not. There are insufficient grounds for any such predictions or even for being optimistic about the likelihood of actually achieving a highly desirable climate future. Democracies can and do fail. Democracy can and does fail. But the right to a healthy environment sits at the intersection of a two-way instrumentality. Uh, a, a nice quote I'll, I'll provide here um, uh, from a book by Ken Conco. On the one hand, the good of a healthy environment has found its footing as a human right because it is a necessary precondition to other fundamental and widely recognized rights. On the other hand, human rights are increasingly understood to be important tools of environmental protection in a world where poverty and dispossession force ecologically unsustainable lives on much of the world's population in pursuit of the goods needed for survival. The available evidence unambiguously suggests that the prospect of a less catastrophic future is brighter if climate governance continues to become more democratically grounded. Some setbacks notwithstanding, in recent decades around the world, the ability of individuals and civil society organizations to participate and have a say on the basis of equality and climate warming has increased both within countries and internationally. The rule of law, more often than not, has prevailed and been extended again within countries and internationally. There has been an explosion of declarations and adjudications within countries and internationally, increasingly internationally, that are beginning to be recognized as politically substantive environmental rights, many of which have profound implications for a more democratic climate governance that will determine to a large extent which of an infinite number of possible climate futures, humans ultimately will live in. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you for your presentation. Um, so from what I gathered from what you said, um, the effect of climate change is going to happen regardless. So what is being done, especially for developing countries to prepare the adaptation strategies for them to prepare beforehand in case of these effects? That's basically my question for you. Um, thank you for your talk. And I was wondering whether you could provide us with some more concrete examples of countries that have actually done good in your, from your point of view in terms of democracy and then also democratizing um, environmental politics. Um, thank you very much. Thank you very much for your talk. Um, I would be interested in knowing how does lobbying fit into the picture of democratic developments and in, in the field of environmental politics? Could there be a positive impact or how do you see this? Thank you. Oh, but that was three okay. questions. Um, so what is being done in developing countries? Some of it uh, has to do with the, the, the extension and, and development of rights. Uh, some of these being uh, rights that uh, uh, developing countries have, have tried to establish vis-a-vis -vis, uh, recognition of, of, uh, of, 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 of rights that countries have vis-a-vis -vis other countries in the in international system. So something like climate change has the prospect of making some countries disappear. Uh, these happen to be almost entirely poor and developing countries who uh, uh, happen to exist in very uh, low-lying areas. Uh, but of course there are certain parts of very rich countries that are highly at risk as well. Uh, in, the, uh, in North America, uh, the oceans have risen uh, about 22 centimeters uh, uh, over the last century. Uh, 22 centimeters is not a whole lot, but it does mean that there are cities in 
of places like Florida that uh, now have streets that are regularly underwater uh, a part of the time. Uh, that much, uh, uh, the, the average global temperature increase has been about one degree uh, Celsius or centigrade, uh, but that also means that the prospect that some rich world cities are not going to be livable uh, in uh, uh, the not too distant future, places like uh, Phoenix, Arizona in the United States. These kinds of effects are even greater in uh, 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 poor, poorer countries, developing countries, many of which happen to live, happen to exist not only in, in lower lying areas, uh, so a, a big portion of Bangladesh, for example, is, is uh, 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 likely to be subject to uh, rising uh, ocean levels, uh, but also many of these countries are in areas of the world that are already quite warm. Uh, they have a climate that's hot to begin with. Uh, so, so a lot of speculation of what is going to happen in the Middle East uh, if large parts of the Middle East become uh, so hot that human beings basically can't be outdoors. Uh, and you, you still have a, a world where there's some very rich places in the Middle East, but not everybody has air conditioning, and it's very unlikely everyone will have air conditioning. Uh, so if you think about what's being done in poor countries, for the most part, if you look at the four categories that I talked about earlier in terms of abatement, uh, not much. Uh, in terms of mitigation, uh, that's where a lot uh, can be done, some of which can be paid for uh, by uh, wealthier countries, and this is a big part of the political campaigns of poorer countries, to, to have richer countries recognize that certain kinds of rights, not only of their citizens to live and have a healthy environment, but the right of the country to continue to exist, its, its sovereignty, to exercise its sovereignty, may depend on mitigating some of, some of the effects uh, of, of climate change um, uh, through techno technological uh, 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 actions or through uh, 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 reforestation, uh, a number of, of, of mechanisms. Um, the second question was examples of countries. I think maybe I've given an example or two, but there's certainly uh, many more. I mean, a lot of, uh, of key activity has happened uh, with the European Union, which has been very uh, proactive in, in uh, establishing uh, various kinds of, of, uh, of standards and expectations uh, for uh, climate uh, reduction. Uh, lots of examples. <coughs> Lots and lots of examples can be found below the nation state. Uh, so there are organizations, international organizations of cities. Uh, there's a particular one, that, the name of which I'm not going to be able to say right now, uh, that's an organization of the 80, 80 of the largest cities in the world. Uh, uh, so there are lots of, there's lots of action happening at that level. Uh, even within uh, what we would normally think of poor or third world countries, there are some that have been very, uh, advanced in terms of their uh, policies and, and governance, uh, some of which is happening at a non-governmental level, some of it's happening at a sub-governmental level. But um, <clears throat> uh, Costa Rica, for example, uh, has uh, uh, made a pledge to become a climate, excuse me, carbon neutral. <clears throat> There's nothing there. There's, no, I realized that too. Carbon yeah. neutral by 2025, which is not that far off. Uh, and, and unlike many rich countries, which seem not to be on target to achieve their, their, uh, their goals, uh, uh, Costa Rica uh, is very much uh, on target. And a lot of that's being achieved by uh, things like uh, reforestation, uh, uh, kind of low technology uh, efforts. Uh, question of lobbying. Uh, lobbying is one of those words that has um, uh, a, a negative connotation because it is the assumption that lobbying is always done by uh, very wealthy uh, either individuals or nefarious uh, organizations. Uh, but what lobbying is no more than is actually just uh, advocacy uh, of some sort or another. Uh, and of course sometimes it can be accompanied by uh, bribery or distribution of favors, uh, but uh, lobbying uh, as it exists in uh, anywhere in the world is really uh, built on the right of uh, free assembly and free speech, uh, the ability to speak to elected representatives and, and present their, their views. So uh, lobbying is something that is also done besides what we might think of as nefarious organizations, 
uh, by a, a great many uh, organizations who advocate very, very effectively for measures to uh, uh, mitigate uh, climate harms, uh, to uh, abate climate emissions, uh, to more effectively uh, adopt uh, measures and strategies for both poor countries and rich countries to uh, uh, adapt uh, to climate change. So the problem with lobbying is that it's an extremely complex, it's actually a very complex phenomenon, and a, a, a blanket prohibition or a silver bullet doesn't exist for uh, changing lobbies so that lobbying so that the, the, the kind of negative dimensions of lobbying that everyone is familiar with uh, uh, don't... Uh, 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 we, we don't throw out the baby with the bathwater, uh, uh, to, to use an old, tired metaphor. Since climate change is natural, it's been happening, it's happening and will continue to change for times to come. Don't you think human effort to try and impede on the process will only make the situation more worse than actually improve it? And then secondly, there's a statement where you say democracy, um, like democracy is, in, is linked to, um, like it implies that democracies have good uh, chances of fighting climate change. Could you elaborate more? Does it mean that only democracies are able to, do, uh, to fight climate change or it was linked to the rights? I didn't get that part clearly. Thank you. Thank you. And then... Uh I'm always going on this side, but that's fine for the time being. Yes, and then two, three. Mm -hmm. um, thank you for a uh, very interesting presentation. Um, I have two questions, too, very briefly. Um, I would um, like to, um, to take um, your opinion on uh, human-made famine and how it fits into the democratization of climatic governance. And the second point is, uh, my second question is about sustainable development. Um, I would like to um, also hear your opinion about how different interpretations of sustainable development in uh, third world countries and first world countries and how it actually fits into the um, global governance of um, climate. Thank you, and then just two rows behind. Um, hello, uh, my name is Matthias Penkin, I'm from the DA, uh, one of the students. So my question was about different perceptions, I think I would just add the, the previous question. Um, we know that there are um, uh, Western, let's say, Western uh, perception of how the climate change works and, what, and how it uh, influences the uh, global environments, but as as we know, uh, all the environmental changes are not centralized. All the, uh, sorry, all the um, actions that made are not centralized by any one single uh, international organization. So my question is, there are definitely different perceptions in different countries, in different, yeah, blocks, let's say so. Are there any clashes between them, like between America, United States of America, and Russia, or uh, such rapid uh, developing countries as China, or India, or South America, South American countries. Thank you. Probably are quite a few, <laughs> but I give the yeah, word back to you. So, another 45 minutes to answer that? Um, best case scenario is only like five minutes. Okay. Um, <laughs> Yeah, I think uh, what I re recall is the very first question, should countries be doing more? Um, I think the answer to that is yes. There's a whole lot of reasons why countries don't do more. Uh, some of it has to do with uh, the difficulty that human beings have of addressing the future. Um, because most of the really severe consequences of climate warming are things that are going to happen um, not to a significant portion of the people in this room. I mean, I'm not going to live long enough uh, in order to suffer from the really 
uh, uh, drastic effects of climate change. Um, and there's a, there's a you know there's a tendency to to deny the future, discount the future, uh, both by politicians and by the citizenry. Uh, it's a fairly complex problem to understand. Uh, when I talked earlier about some of the characteristics of it, uh, some of those it's it's a it's a wicked problem politically because it really requires action by all by not, I don't want to say almost, but a very high proportion of human beings. It's not the sort of thing that that can be uh, addressed by a small elite group who just happens to uh, uh, come up with the right answer and imposes it on everyone else. Uh, or so far as, so far as uh, uh, we know, there's not any kind of safe and sure technological fix to it. Uh, sometimes we have uh, in, uh, major kinds of environmental problems that can be largely significantly addressed through the development of new technology. That doesn't mean that many, many different technologies might not contribute to addressing climate warming, but there's no one silver bullet to it. Uh, all these things make it difficult for countries to uh, make decisions in the short run, in part because um, everything that we know about climate warming is that the things that we have to do to, to reduce the causes and effects are costly. And the costs are not evenly distributed, but they're very widely distributed. Uh, and people don't like to pay. They would prefer to think that something will just go away. Uh, and when I mean people here, I mean uh, business people, I mean politicians, I mean uh, uh, general citizenry. Uh, can only democracy address climate change? Uh, my argument would be that ultimately, if it can be addressed uh, semi-successfully, depends on your definition of success, because I think preventing it is now impossible. Uh, it is happening already. It's going to continue to get worse. Even if we did everything that we possibly could do starting tomorrow, it's going to continue to get worse. The real question about climate warming is how fast it's going to get worse and how much worse is it going to be. Uh, we certainly are many things that could be done that would slow down uh, the uh, a advent of various harms from climate warming and uh, put a limit on them so that they only get so bad and, and not uh, uh, continue uh, to get even worse. So I would not argue that only democracy in every shape or form and in every place can address climate change. And certainly you have examples of of uh, 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 China, for example, being a country that's not uh, especially democratic, uh, deciding to uh, raise building standards, efficiency standards, uh, to adopt wide, uh, widespread ad adaptation, adoption of, of um, solar uh, energy. Uh, so th those were not choices that were made democratically. Uh, certainly they will make a difference in the trajectory that China was on uh, 10 years ago and the trajectory, they have made a difference in the trajectory that China is on today. Uh, famine. Um, that, that's, a, that's a very difficult, and I think the, the, I'm not an expert on the scientific research uh, or the social scientific research about famine. Um, there certainly have been predictions that uh, famine will increase as a consequence of climate change. And it's certainly the case that you could point to certain places in the world where there have been food shortages that uh, have certainly been exacerbated by uh, climate change. And I think the uh, 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 Sahara and Sub-Saharan Africa is a very obvious example. Food shortages are not the same thing as famine. And I think Amartya Sen and many other people who've studied uh, 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 the history of famines uh, in the last 20 or 30 years find, can't find a single example of a famine that actually had to happen because there was a shortage of food. Uh, famines are a failure of political and economic and social systems to get food uh, where it really is needed to the degree that people are dying from, from lack of food. Uh, now, again, that doesn't mean that famine won't result directly from climate change in the future. Uh, but, uh, so I'm not going to give a, 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 I'm not going to predict one way or the other, but I think that uh, we, we need to be careful in saying that uh, climate change itself causes famine uh, because what climate change can do is cause shortages of food and particularly shortages of certain kinds of food. This is the other issue with, 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 uh, 
uh, food shortages. It's not necessarily a case overall of a shortage of food. The very famous um, uh, Irish famine in the middle of the 19th century uh, was, was a result of a shortage of potatoes, uh, not a shortage of food overall in Ireland. It's just that many of the people who died or immigrated couldn't afford to buy anything except potatoes, and there weren't potatoes. Um, and I think that's, and again, that's true in many other uh, uh, historic famines that have been studied. Sustainable development um, and questions of difference between first and third world perspectives. Yes, I think first and third worlds, uh, the first worlds and the third world, uh, and those of course are, are very kind of, of um, a, a gross generalizations to say first world and third world. Uh, think very differently about sustainable development. That's why we came up with the term sustainable development. Uh, there, were, there was a lot of debate back in the uh, 1970s, early 1980s, uh, and many people argued that ultimately what was going to be required is that uh, some countries were not going to be able to become as rich as the United States or Austria or the rest of Europe. They were going to have to not develop their material standard of wealth as much as uh, these other countries already had by the 1970s, and that already rich countries would have to reduce their standards of wealth in order to avoid uh, major environmental problems. Uh, and so what happened in the uh, early 1980s up through uh, 1987 when the World Commission on Environment and Development issued its report is a lot of very savvy uh, politicians, and that's who was serving on the commission, said, uh, why don't we come up with a term that describes the fact that, that declares, it doesn't really provide evidence that it's possible, it declares that we can have our cake and eat it too, or we can eat our cake and have it too. And we'll call it sustainable development. Uh, and that's where the term sustainable development comes from. So it says, yes, we can have the highest possible standards of environmental quality uh, and not have to sacrifice uh, any level, any significant level of, of um, uh, material, economic wealth and, 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 and well-being. Uh, so poor countries, all, the, the trick is they can develop, but they just have to do it sustainably. And rich countries have to somehow redevelop so that their development becomes sustainable. Um, the fly in all of this ointment is that nobody's provided an example of sustainable development in modernity at the kind of levels of material uh, wealth of that uh, the current rich world enjoys. So if we have examples of sustainable development, it's sustainable development uh, models that don't seem particularly attractive either to the rich world or the, or, or the, or the third world. Um, but of course, sustainable development is still being contested as an idea, and a lot of that contestation is between the first world and the third world. Clashes between countries versus perception? Yes, lots of clashes. Uh, some of these are pretty fundamental clashes in terms of how you understand things. So. The United States and Europe have tended to, uh, to the extent that they agree, they agree that something like climate change should be uh, dealt with by having uh, all countries reduce their emissions from their current levels. Uh, so you kind of grandparent in countries at the level they're at now and everyone needs to reduce, um, depending on the estimate, 20%, 50%, 80% below where they are now. Uh, and poor countries need to not increase their level of climate uh, affecting gases significantly. Maybe some increase in order to allow some development, uh, but not significantly increase. The problem is that even if rich countries were to reduce their climate uh, emissions, climate affecting emissions by 50% or 80%, uh, they still would be higher than, than the uh, emission levels at, of many, many uh, societies and economies in the world. Uh, there, there doesn't seem to be any way of threading that needle that doesn't involve some significant amount of economic sacrifice. And that's what makes it a very, very uh, wicked uh, political problem. How many more questions do we have? And because maybe we can squeeze them all in the last 
spannend. This side doesn't want to ask any questions. So, oh, there is someone. Okay, and we're going to move over there, and then and then and then we'll deal with the rest. Yes. Uh, I would like to ask, uh, how shall how should we understand that uh, the success of China in global climate governance, although it is not the uh, leading country in democracy and human rights, how should we understand that? such country can be successful at global governance of uh, climate. Yeah, I would like to ask this. Thank, Thank you. you. And then we're going to move over there again. Yes. Good evening. Um, I come from the background of activism and I have recently had a chance to interact with a group that condemns democracy uh, in this regard and sees climate uh, change and global warming as a failure, a profound failure of democracy, having two out of three world's biggest greenhouse gas emitters being US and European Union, both um, countries or a group of countries that have democracy as their cornerstone. So how would you comment on that? Thank you. Well, so is there. Yes, sorry. Gentleman, the first row. Uh, governing climate future is very important. And at the same time, one would like to know what are the standards against which one measure the democracy versus controlling, governing the climate future, because these are general. And if there are standards, it would be easy to measure and then make decisions and conclusions and say, here the governing is going well, in the other places it is not going well. My observations, for instance, Regarding democracy, take the United States of America. The assumption is that the United States of America is a democratic country. Nowadays, under the current government, uh, Trump is refusing certain international agreements which are in the direction of controlling and governing the climate future. Very bluntly, he's against it, he doesn't want it. So, how would we uh, measure, make conclusions regarding this? If we talk about democracy, on the other side, decisions like this, which international community more or less has made agreement and we're supposed to implement it and go ahead with it. Thank you. Um, at this stage, I think there are no more, no more questions from the audience. Um, that, uh, I had a similar question like that, so may, may I abuse my, my powers here as a, as, a, as, a, as a moderator to ask a question. Um, your, your subtitle, Democracy, Rights and the Global Environment, it reminded me of, uh, of the Freedom House surveys. And, um, mm -hmm. and the 2018 uh, survey came out recently and uh, basically shows a somewhat similar pattern as in previous years, so uh, one third of the states are classified as free, one third partly free, and one third as not free. But there is a certain tendency, and that's the, the tendency goes away from the free. Um, does that have any repercussions, or is that likely to have any repercussions for the global environment? Or do we have perhaps certain diplomatic instruments that go beyond regime type and there's some hope, nevertheless. Okay. Um, so, how do we understand the success of China? I think this is an instance where you really have to think about what you mean by success. I think you can point to some individual a small number of individual policy successes, and I mentioned a couple of those earlier uh, in terms of the things like building standards or requiring uh, 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 solar uh, uh, energy uh, installation. Overall, I think China's 
role uh, contribution to climate governance, uh, successful climate governance, has been an abject failure. It's one of the one of the really, really dark kinds of developments of the last uh, uh, 20 years. China has become uh, uh, gone from a, a position of emitting something like one fourth as many greenhouse gases as the United States to uh, uh, getting close to 50 percent more greenhouse gases than the United States over the course of 30 years. Uh, I wouldn't characterize that as any way, shape, or form a success. On the other hand, again, if you're looking at international politics, uh, the willingness of China to negotiate uh, before uh, 2015 uh, had a very dramatic uh, impact on the success of, uh, of uh, reaching the, uh, the, the Paris Climate Agreement. So again, there's a kind of political success that's uh, completely disconnected to what China has actually been doing and what China's promised to do, which is not all that impressive. China has promised that it will, it, it, its commitment is to cease increasing the amount of its greenhouse gas emissions by 2030. Um, that's not m much of a real commitment that's going to really make that much difference in terms of, of the global levels of greenhouse gases. Uh, failures of democracy. Of rich countries, um, yes, I think if you look at the three biggest, not countries, but the biggest uh, political units that uh, emit greenhouse gases, and again, if you, even if you go to per capita and start including countries like Canada, which actually emits greenhouse gases at a higher rate than the United States, and so does Australia, uh, these happen to be uh, democracies, and I don't think that you can talk about uh, the policies of them uh, or of very many other countries with respect to climate warming as being uh, uh, at, at all very successful. Um, in, in part because they've really not attempted to do very much. I think the European Union is the only one of all of those I just mentioned that's done much over the last 20 years to reduce emission of, uh, of, of greenhouse uh, uh, chemicals. Uh, on the other hand, if we look at the list from Freedom House or, or uh, any, anyone else of non-democracies, uh, some of those have done worse. Uh, some others have not increased their degree of greenhouse emissions basically because of economic failure. Uh, if your economy is doing poorly, and this is one of the reasons why the, the United States succeeded uh, what seemed like fairly dramatically from about uh, 2010 till 2017 in reducing its emissions of greenhouse gases, it was almost an entirely driving fewer miles, you're going to emit fewer uh, greenhouse gases. And that certainly explained a big part of, of the temporary minor success that a country like the United States had over that six or six to eight year period. Uh, but if we look at uh, places where climate action actually has happened, it is in the democracies. It is at the state level in the United States, in places like California. Uh, it is in cities uh, across the United States. Hundreds and hundreds of cities. It's at the uh, national level in some countries within the European Union. It is at the city and provincial level within the European Union. And it is in a small number of, of, uh, uh, of uh, other countries outside of those uh, uh, agglomerations, such as, for example, as I mentioned earlier, Costa Rica, uh, uh, which uh, has, has, made, has made and is committed to making even more fairly and again, those are democracies, not uh, countries that you would list in the uh, one-third uh, non-democratic uh, 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 as, as determined by Freedom House. And of course, that takes me right to the question of standards. And I wasn't quite sure whether you were asking whether there were standards about climate policy or governance or standards about democracy, because there are standards of both. What qualifies as democracy and uh, organizations like Freedom House and many other people uh, do say uh, that we can, we can develop indexes or we can uh, develop uh, various kinds of continua that measure the degree of democratization. Uh, and certainly we can actually measure what countries are doing uh, either per capita or in an aggregate level, what, what's happening in terms of 
of uh, climate warming. Uh, are uh, climate emissions uh, going down per capita, leveling off, increasing less rapidly? Uh, those are all standards that can be measured. Uh, with respect to climate, the one thing that we can't talk about is climate warming that will not happen at all because so much of that is already baked into the system. Uh, but the various projections of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change uh, are pretty wide projections. Uh, there's the do-nothing projection, how bad it would be by 2100 uh, if nothing at all is done, if we just keep doing what we're doing now, uh, as opposed to taking a fairly dramatic action in the next uh, 10 years, uh, a, a difference uh, of uh, three or four degrees uh, centigrade or Celsius, uh, which is all the difference between Antarctica and Greenland melting and Antarctica and Greenland not melting. Uh, uh, ocean rise uh, being limited to perhaps no more than 50 uh, uh, centimeters as opposed to ocean rise of a couple of meters. Uh, and the consequences of that are, 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 are really different. They're both, in a sense, collective failures because something bad has happened that could have been prevented entirely if people had acted 30 and 40 years ago, uh, but one is much worse than the other. So again, there are these kinds of standards. These are not standards, however, that are uncontestable. People do debate and argue and come into conflict with each other politically about how these standards should be understood and interpreted and applied. Um, so then, to Freedom House survey. Um, yeah, uh, I think there's a, th there's a danger in thinking that democracy is an inevitable march of progress, that's simply something that's going to happen. Um, Victor Hugo's words of an idea whose time has come and therefore it's just going to spread. And I mean, there was a lot of talk like this in the 1990s when, when uh, a number of countries uh, uh, switched over from less democratic forms of governance to at least the, the accoutrements of, of democracy. But if democracy as an idea were really that power, powerful, it's had 2,500 years to have really uh, taken over the world and, and, and it hasn't. So I think that it's certainly the case that um, things can go backwards and we certainly have examples of uh, what seemed like democratic progress going backwards in specific countries. Um, we certainly have examples of countries that are less democratic uh, than they were, than they seem to be or that they were 10 years ago. But we also have examples of countries that have actually moved in a significant direction toward becoming more democratic. Peru, for example, uh, what's, what's happened in Peru in the last two or uh, a couple of years, I think is, 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 uh, is, is very impressive. Um, so does this have, a, have implications for uh, climate governance? I think that it does. I think that a country like the United States, that I would agree is not as democratic as many other uh, countries. There are lots of ways that the United States, um, in spite of its uh, uh, tendency not as democratic as many other countries uh, and in ways that Americans are not particularly good at, uh, at being self-critical about. Uh, but um, I guess I'm not sure, um, Marcus, whether your question was, am I predicting the inevitable triumph of democracy? Uh, if that's the case, no, I'm not. Uh, I think that, uh, and, and, and I tried to emphasize, uh, democracies do fail and democracy uh, does fail. I do think, however, that uh, it is, if we're talking about climate governance in the future, uh, the best bet for adopting a kind of climate governance that has everyone engaged in participating in, agreeing with the shift of norms and behaviors on the global level that is required to successfully address a problem like that, that really can only happen in a democratic context. And there's probably nothing uh, that would accelerate that more than, uh, than strengthening democracy. Thank you very much, Robert, for, for, your, for your talk, for answering all of our questions. I think that deserves a big round of applause.